That's a tough act to follow because you talked about trakes and tweets and tar, and <laughs> we got to talk about that. And that was my cover slide initially, and then I looked at the lineup and I said, I better do something. So there's my, yeah, yep, okay. <laughs> and I sent a tweet during that last talk, and it's already been retweeted five times, which is kind of fun. But anyway, um, so I'm learning things. So let's talk a little bit about electronic cigarettes um, and tobacco cessation. I have no conflicts of interest. Um, so we'll go over, first of all, why it's important, what works and what doesn't, um, how to do this in a real uh, life setting, and how you make it work in clinic and with patients. Um, we'll go over electronic cigarettes, different types of them, and discussion of data and outcomes or lack thereof. Why do we care? It's too late. Does it matter? Does it make a difference? And a lot of those people may not quit anyway. Really, why should we care? Well, we, we want to know about does it matter for different groups of people? Normal, healthy people. Is it going to make a huge difference if we work on them to get them to quit smoking and go through a lot of effort or delay their surgery to get them to uh, quit smoking and get off the cigarettes? Does it matter for standard healthy patients? There may be decreased post-operative complications, particularly respiratory complications for us. Um, there's a lot of data on wound healing issues in the plastics and orthopedic literature. And a lot of the things with plastics, particularly cosmetic surgery or orthopedic elective joint replacement and things are purely elective. But a lot of times we deal with cancer and we can't just electively put that off or uh, defer it forever. Um, so we, we sometimes are put between a rock and a hard place trying to get people to quit. Even if they're a healthy patient, they do have benefits, and I'll, I'll talk about that. And long-term benefits, getting them to quit will decrease risk of cancer, heart disease, et cetera, down the road. So this next group right here I think is pretty, pretty interesting, the borderline inoperable patient, okay? Um, these are the patients whose pulmonary function is really not very good, but they otherwise could be a surgical candidate, and they're currently smoking. Um, and then the last group is inoperable patients. Does it matter? They can't have surgery. Why should they quit? Does it make a difference at all um, for, for lung cancer patients? So we know that smoking is not just a cause of cancers, but it actually promotes growth of existing malignancies um, and uh, promotes tumor growth, um, not just generating new cancer, but there is differences in um, uh, laboratory data of tumor growth rates when exposed or not exposed to nicotine and other tobacco um, byproducts. So we, we know that cessation impacts long-term survival in early stage lung cancer with uh, um, improved uh, all-cause mortality in people who quit and uh, less recurrence in people who quit. But wound complications, cardiovascular risk, yes, we want to decrease these things. However, a lot of the data doesn't show clear benefit until at least four weeks out. Um, and there is some consideration that even shorter term cessation, when people stop smoking and they quit, their respiratory cilia are just starting to wake up. A lot of that mucus and things start getting mobilized and coughed up and there's more secretions sometimes in some of these people. And so, so the benefit is seen, but it can be delayed. And do we want to delay patients like that? Um, this was looked at in the STS database. Re death and respiratory complications did slowly decrease, and they couldn't find an optimal cut time or point interval, which was determined the, the you know, key for preoperative cessation. There was not one time, but the uh, complications slowly diminished. Um, so yes, it does help all patients, long-term um, you know, future cancer risk, other kinds of cardiovascular risk, yes. but. But let's talk about the borderline operative candidates. Um, I've got several of these people, and uh, our nurses uh, in clinic are tobacco cessation counselors, and they see these as great challenges and, and, and some, some victories. Um, but one case I'll use just to illustrate this, 64-year-old guy has pack and a half smoking habit, 45 years, he gets a low-dose CT, screening CT. He's, he says he's asymptomatic, but he's got a pretty significant cough, and he's maybe lost about five pounds in the last year, but he got a screening CT, um, and he was pretty far out from his head and neck cancer. So screening CT shows his right middle lobe mass. He got a bronchoscope and 
um, indeterminate biopsy, and then a CT guided needle biopsy, and he was referred to me after diagnosis of squamous <coughs> cell cancer. That's great. Um, looking at him in the clinic, uh, I don't know how to quantify the eyeball test, but we all know the eyeball test. And this guy was not really passing it. Um, his FEV1 was right at 40%, diffusion 38%. He was kind of hot, hacking and coughing and, and didn't look the sturdiest guy in clinic. So we talked to him about his perioperative risk being very high. I said, with those PFTs, if we do an operation, you've got a high chance of respiratory failure or ending up in the uh, ICU or tracheostomy or worse. And um, we discussed with him other options of non-surgical treatment and, uh, versus tobacco cessation. Well, we gave him a quit plan. We had our nurses work with him, counsel him, and, and follow up. But also, we got him on a walking regimen every day, and uh, he quit smoking uh, the very next day. Um, four weeks later, rechecked his PFTs, and yeah, they improved. Okay, great. He got through surgery, and of course he did well, otherwise I wouldn't be sharing the case with you, right? Um, so this is, a, this is a guy who did not really look good on the eyeball test, didn't look good numerically. We got him tuned up and then got him home. He did go home with uh, nasal cannula, oxygen, and after a few days he stopped it himself. Um, he was abstinent for tobacco for six months after that, and then now he's about a year and a half out and still uh, not smoking um, on last telephone follow-up. But the six-month follow-up we had was, was validated with carbon monoxide, um, exhale breath. Anyway, his, his tumor came out, he did well, and uh, he was referred for adjuvant chemotherapy and tolerated that fine. So some of our risk, some of our risk is reversible in select patients. You know, yes, everybody should stop smoking. Some people, it makes a huge difference. Um, his tumor was not real small that SBRT would be a great option for. Um, he had otherwise a potentially life-threatening malignancy, and without surgery, I didn't see good good uh, curative options for him. Um, four weeks of delay didn't really impact his treatment, and he got through it. Now, yeah, we've got five or six other cases similar to him of people we've tuned up for surgery and a few that we weren't able to get improved. But we also put them on a walking regimen and frequent telephone follow-up. So, so some of these borderline patients you can convert to maybe a lower risk status. Um, does it matter for non-operative patients? Does it matter for people who we see with lung cancer across the board? You know, this is, this is some data of all comers with lung cancer. Some got surgery, didn't, it's all stages, but there was um, significant increase in death and overall survival in all comers of lung cancer. And I use this slide more when I talk to medical oncologists because medical oncologists kind of feel the futility of it. You know, oh, people, if they've got uh, uh, malignancy that's advanced and we're doing chemotherapy, radiation, et cetera, there may not be any real benefit and it's a hassle. I mean, that survival curve, if this was a drug that made that big of a difference, the medical oncologists would be going nuts about it, right? Um, so it's a nine month median survival difference. Now, that's a selection bias, maybe more motivated people, maybe people with better social or family support were able to quit, and that's a you know, surrogate for other things that are, that are going to impact their outcome. But, but in, in all comers in lung cancer, there is uh, differences in survival. Okay, 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 I get it. That's important. How do you do that? We don't have time. Uh, clinic is busy. And even if I tell them things, they won't quit anyway, right? There's a five-step outline, and then we condense it a little bit for uh, the physicians in clinic and outsource a lot of that to our cessation counselors. But ask advise, assess, assist, and arrange. So the first two are the key points of asking every patient and advising them. There has been data shown that brief physician advice will take a patient's um, spontaneous quit rate of like one to two percent and double that. Well, that sounds great, but it's still a minimal amount of people that'll quit with just basic advice. Um, and then instead of doing the uh, ask advise, and then the assist, the assess, assist, arrange, we outsource that. Um, as physicians, we want to know about these things, but we can't do it all. We don't have the time, and we don't have the expertise, the knowledge, or, or the ability to do this for everybody, but we get them referred to 
uh, group counseling classes, telephone quit lines are available in every state and many of them will give you um, nicotine replacement therapy. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a tobacco cessation specialist, uh, two of them in our clinic that work with all these people and do telephone follow-up. So that's great, so we can ask them uh, and uh, advise them and then refer them to somebody else, but how do we help them quit? Pharmacotherapy, uh, drugs, um, can help people quit and greatly improves quit rate. I'll go through it real briefly, nicotine replacement therapy, patches and other forms, uh, bupropion and varenicline. What we do is you gotta ask people what they've tried in the past and what's worked and what hasn't and try to explore those options. There's lots of different options here. And uh, in general, a meta-analysis showed that any single agent worked better than placebo. I mean, I hope so. They're FDA approved to treat that, right? They better work better than placebo. Um, in general, bupropion or Zyvan or Wellbutrin works as well as a single agent nicotine replacement therapy. Varenicline was shown to be superior. Now combination was better. Now what do you mean combination? Well a patch, a nicotine patch, is a slow acting long release form, right? And all the other forms are immediate release. It's kind of the same thinking of somebody with chronic pain with a fentanyl patch and then PO for breakthrough, right? So a very common thing we do is put people on a 21 patch and then give them gum or lozenges for breakthrough. And that is superior to single agent. Um, we also uh, have seen that varenicline is about equivalent to combination um, and it is effective and acceptable to combine these drugs. So. There are NCCN guidelines about this, and I'm not going to get too far into it. And actually, it says no part of this can be reproduced without express consent, so that's, that's the only part I reproduced. But uh, the NCCN guidelines kind of <laughs> drilled down into them. Basically, first-line therapy is varenicline or combination NRT, like I discussed, discussed. And counseling is an integral part of that. Well, if you fail one of these things, second line is whatever you didn't try first time around, right? And continued failure, they'll uh, then go on with bupropion. Now, people who have mood issues, bupropion does have an anti-depressant um, effect, and so that might be, for, for those patients, that might be the right first line. But in general, that's what they recommend. And so how effective are these? Uh, like I said, without telling patients anything, a few percent will quit that can double by just the physician talking to them and telling them it's important. Long-term quit rates are better, but not great. And combination, um, uh, nicotine is, is better than one agent alone. There's one study that showed about a 40%. Now, that was um, point prevalence, meaning they uh, just surveyed them at one point and they didn't validate it, but it, it does show some promising results. A lot of people say, whoa, 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 that Chantix stuff, it's got bad side effects. It has a lot of psychiatric issues. And that was a big barrier. Um, this came out this past year. Now, in disclosure, now I don't have any disclosures, but this study sure does. It was funded by Pfizer and GSK, so there is, there is industry sponsoring of it, but it was very well done with four arms, placebo, um, patch, uh, varenicline or bupropion. And then this was in, half of the patients had a psychiatric history, half did not. Because they wanted to know, is this exacerbating psychiatric symptoms? There was no increased psychiatric adverse events. And out of the 8,000 people, there was one person who committed suicide. And they were on the placebo. So um, looking at this entire cohort of people, it was not felt to increase or exacerbate any kind of psychiatric side effects. So, all right, let's get to the more lively part. This uh, electronic cigarettes. How many people have had a patient bring an electronic cigarette into the uh, office and show them, right? Has anyone walked in the clinic door and seen them actually vaping? Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we gotta remind them that our campus is smoke-free and that includes electronic cigarettes, but a lot of people will use those and we should know some things about them. But unfortunately, we don't know everything about them. It's not a drug delivery device because it can't be used. Um, there's no data to support, oh boy, there's no data to support that it actually effectively works to treat a disease and so it's not been approved as a drug. Um, the outcomes are not proven. And it's gonna be hard because the um, variable, there's a, quite a, a lot of variables of how much nicotine, other carrier agents, flavorings, et cetera. 
It's, it has been deemed as a tobacco product and it should be regulated as such, and there's uh, some changes in the way with that. And wh where did these come from? Well, this guy, uh, 1963 in the United States, he, he had a patent for it. And he took it around to some tobacco companies. He tried to sell it. Nobody was interested. They said, yeah, that's nice. Okay, forget about it. And, and that patent got forgotten about and then expired. And, and then this, uh, this gentleman, Han Lick, is a pharmacist in China who lost his father to lung cancer. And his father was a heavy smoker. He was smoking. And he wanted to find a way to quit smoking. So this pharmacist in his house developed the modern electronic cigarette and entered the US markets in 2007. And so what are they? Well, it's a battery, a heating element, some liquid, and then that liquid aerosol gets vaporized and drawn into the lungs. Now, wait a minute, about eight slides ago, we had a prescription nicotine inhaler. That's different. The nicotine inhaler does not heat the substance, and when it's drawn in, it's mostly deposited in the oropharyngeal and buccal mucosa. It's a little bit slower pharmacokinetics or slower uptake of the nicotine, and um, it doesn't give quite as much of a nicotine um, hit as an as a e-cigarette. It's not drawn into the lungs. Okay, whereas this makes a vapor that can be drawn deeper. Okay, so there's different forms of these. The first generation, uh, these are the ones you see commonly at the uh, gas station or convenience store, sold right next to the candy and everything else. And uh, they may or may not be refillable, rechargeable. And there's little cartridges that, that can be used to refill them. They're less expensive. They're widely marketed and very, very available. Um, the second generation devices have a tank to store the fluid, larger tank battery, and the liquid comes in many flavors. And this is a whole different topic and a different thing, and it's not really for our patient population, but the liquid flavors are being made in everything from tobacco flavor to gummy bear, cotton candy, strawberry. Okay, who are they targeting with that, right? And then so the third generation, yeah, look at that thing, holy cow. Um, that's got a higher power battery. It has controls for how much um, heat uh, is produced and the, the, the size of the inhalation. And yeah, these kinds of things are, are, are quite complex. And some of them can even uh, explode and catch fire. So, um, we, but these are usually just at specialized nicotine uh, uh, or e-cigarette shops. And, but they say, hey, it's just nicotine and water. That's all you're getting, just nicotine and water. Well, I'm not a biochemist or, or, and I kind of got through organic chemistry, but not great, but look at that thing. That does not dissolve in water real well. It doesn't, okay? It, it dissolves in alcohol, but then you heat that up and it'll catch on fire, but, so we don't want to do that. So, so uh, nicotine and water, you need a carrier substance, which is usually propylene glycol or glycerin. That's great. It helps it all, you know, mix and then vaporize. And then food flavorings are added in. Hey, that's FDA approved. I mean, that cup of coffee is FDA approved. It doesn't mean I should suck it in my lungs, okay? <laughs> this is supposed to go down the esophagus. That's what it's improved for, right? And we know that the esophagus and trachea are two different pipes, right? So, so they're, they're FDA approved, they're all approved, but not for inhalation use, right? But you'll hear patients say, no, it's only approved things. Eh, yeah, right. Okay, and then the problem is, is uh, not only is, is this food additives approved, but, and we know what these are, but then those components get heated up and they get changed into weird aldehydes and ketones and esters and things that, that cannot be in the initial thing. So the, the heated product may be different than the, the ingredients. Anyway, and besides the liquid and things, there's metal particles because the heating element coil can fragment little tiny bits of it and you're getting, all these kinds of random pieces of metal suck deep in your lungs, and that, that probably can't be too good either. Um, but, uh, but hey, it's better than smoking is, is, is what you'll hear a lot of. Like, Doc, this is better than smoking, right? And yes, these are known toxins and known carcinogens. And there's between a four and hundredfold difference decrease in an e-cigarette compared to a regular cigarette. Okay, they have less junk in them. That's great. Um, and there's been a lot of meta-analysis to say, does it help people quit smoking? Well, the, the conclusions are all over. And this slide's very busy, but this is a couple excerpts. They had a high quit rate, okay. The next one, well, no, they were no significant difference. What, the next one, eh, they were worse. 
So these differences are all over the board, and a lot of it's depending on how it is measured. Um, so it's very variable if these actually help people quit smoking, ranging from superior to inferior. And basically a position paper from ASCO says we should advise all people to use FDA approved things to quit. There's a paper that said, oh, we got a 31% cessation with, with e-cigarettes. Now this is an email survey of people who bought electronic cigarettes. Their response rate wasn't great, 200 out of 5,000. Now who's gonna respond? People that might have something that is favorable or they wanna share. Anyway, when you get down into it, yeah, 31% of this cohort actually responded or uh, quit. However, of the quitting um, patients, over half of them were still on the electronic cigarette and couldn't quit that. So, you know, it's not, it's not an end all be all. And this is point prevalence with an email survey of are you smoking currently, yes, no. Not have you been smoke free in a week or month. Self-selected population, self-reported data. So I'm on a, I'm on a tobacco um, a committee through the ISLC and they update and come out with position papers and things. We um, basically said similar things to ASCO. If you're smoking, use approved methods. If you're using both, <laughs> that electronic cigarette's not helping you quit. If, you're, if it's not working, stop that and then use approved drugs. And then if you have quit but you're on the electronic cigarette, try tapering off that. So in summary, you know, cessation benefits all patients. I think there's a lot of bang for the buck in the borderline operable patients. We've also incorporated in our lung screening program because these are a lot of people who have other future risk. And while they might have 1% lung cancer, our screened population at our institution, 70% are actively smoking. So I think it can benefit all patients. We fail a lot. We give a lot of advice, we try and we fail. But for the patients that do quit, it makes a big difference. Use approved drugs, combination drugs. Uh, combination drugs work better than single agents and electronic cigarettes are really unproven. Um, and they may have a lot of future unknown harm. There's, um, there's been a lot of reports published uh, about bronchiolitis obliterans and patterns of lung injury in people working in a, a popcorn factory because of uh, flavorings and things that are in the air secondhand. And a lot of those food additives um, uh, are the same types of things that are, are put into like electronic cigarettes that they've found in food industry workers in chronic lung disease. So I, I can only imagine that if you're intentionally inhaling a lot of those things day after day after day, um, it, it may have some downstream non-oncologic but inflammatory or other lung disease issues. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.